Okay, if you have a Bible with you or on your smartphone, you can turn to Philippians chapter 3. And I want to talk to you today about Jesus' joy. That sounds kind of like a strange thing. How do I get joy out of following Jesus? Well, I'll tell you. And then we'll see how the Apostle Paul does it. Whenever we walk with God, believing in Him, trusting in Him, putting all of our trust in Jesus Christ, then what we experience is we experience joy. Happiness, happiness is a nice thing, but it's only because of circumstances. Happiness comes, happiness goes. How many of you have had that experience? Happiness comes, happiness goes. Okay, so yeah, by the time you get to be my age, you know, that's happened quite a few times, and you begin to understand that the reality is, is that joy can be found in God alone. Actually, one of the scriptures says, Whenever we know God and we're in a right relationship with Him, we have righteousness, which is a right relationship with God. That's what righteousness means. Um, we have peace, which is not the absence of conflict, but peace is the overwhelming sense of being in line with God's plans and purposes that comes from Him alone. And joy, of course, is what we experience because He has great joy Whenever he can love us, whenever he can exercise grace towards us, whenever he can be merciful of us, he created humans for his pleasure. He was not lonely. He created humans for his pleasure. So here we are. And so for those of us, we remember last week, we used an acronym, JOY, J-O-Y, Jesus, Others, You, and if you love people we, in, that, in, that cat, in that priority list of loving Christ first, Jesus, and then love others first, and then exercise all that love that remains on yourself, then in those prior, priorities you'll be fulfilling the, first, the two great commandments. So we want to understand that in Jesus we find great joy. Jesus is the sole constituent of our joy. There is nothing else, I'm here to tell you. So we've been moving along in our study of uh, the, the Paul's letter to his friends in Philippi. And so I want Dave to put the map up there, and you can kind of see in the red circle. Uh, you can kind of see in the red circle, that's where Philippi is. Jerusalem is way down here. So these guys have gone from here to here to here to here. So they are traveling around the Roman Empire, utilizing all of the transportation that's available to fulfill. But Paul wanted to go to Asia. Now Asia is what we call over here. This is Turkey uh, today, but that's Asia. And so the Holy Spirit said no and appeared to Paul in a vision and directed him over here to what is Europe. And so he got to go there along with his traveling companions, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. And so whenever they arrived in Philippi, they came and the Holy Spirit directed them down to the river. And there was Lydia and all of her friends and they were praying. And as they were praying, see they didn't have enough believers to have a synagogue or a special place. And this is a town that's filled with pagans. So, and idol worshipers as we'll find out. So whenever we look at this, we can see that Paul, first of all, goes to those that God has called him to, and that's what happens with us. Oftentimes, we don't know people, but God calls us to go and to speak with them and to be able to share the good news with them. So Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke meet with these ladies by the river with Lydia, and so one of the things happens to another is they start sharing the good news about what Jesus Christ has done for them, and by, by his sacrifice on the cross, by the resurrection, by his ascension, and now by the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, on the day of Pentecost. And so what we find out is they all become believers. And so as they become believers, they all start uh, taking care of them. And not only that, they begin to find the true freedom that comes, in, comes with Christ by believing in Christ. And so we can find that joy brings freedom. There is nothing else other than the joy of knowing Christ that brings freedom. And we're going to find it throughout this passage in the first 13 verses. 
So as Paul and Silas are going through town, there's a slave girl, and she's controlled by she's controlled by an evil spirit. Some of them call it Python or Pythia. And so she's telling everybody that Paul and Silas have come and who they are, they're servants of the Most High God. Well, what's happening is, is that she's drawing attention to Paul and Silas, and it's not God by the Holy Spirit drawing attention. So this is becoming a real distraction for Paul and Silas as they seek to minister one-on-one -on -one with the people in the city and bring them the freedom, let them experience the joy. And so what does Paul do? He takes authority over the demonic force and binds it and casts it out. So she is now free. Unfortunately, her owners, and she may have only been 11 or 12 years old. And so unfortunately, her owners don't see freedom in the same light. Paul has freed them of a source of income. And so that's always bad whenever you do that to people. Don't ever be careful when you do that. So, and so out of the casting of the spirit of witchcraft out of this girl, they have changed her from being bound by demonic forces, and now she is free of that control that was in her life. So she's going to find joy as she walks along. Maybe she goes and fellowships with Lydia and the members of her household. We don't know. But her owners are really upset because they, Paul and Silas, by the power of God, have ruined a source of income. And so that's always bad when you mess with the money. And so they got the civil authorities to take and to bind them and to put them in stocks. Now stocks are a set of wooden things that have holes cut out in them. They're, they're split in half so they open. But the holes are far enough apart so that whenever you're forced to sit on the floor in your own filth, no food, no nothing, and you put your feet in these things, your legs are spread so far apart that it almost disjoints your hips. Extremely painful, no padding. And so they are put in these stocks, they're chained, and so they can't move. They're in the deepest level of the prison in Philippi. And so Paul and Silas are bound in there, and they are stuck. Their freedom has been taken away by these people who were upset because they set somebody free. And so whenever we begin to see that type of thing happen, we know that the enemy of our souls has plans to be able to disrupt whatever God is doing. And he's trying here. But God, the creator of all, has another plan for Paul and Silas. And so about midnight, as they are singing the Psalms, and a lot of people think that they're singing out of Psalm 119, about verse 62, where it says, In the midnight I sing your song. They're not singing in the midnight hour, by the way. Some of you don't even know what that is. I'll explain it later. Okay. So as they're singing, as they're singing the Psalms, then all of a sudden there is a massive earthquake. And so we have seen earthquakes come at other times. Like whenever Paul, Paul and uh, uh, P, or Peter and John were arrested and they came back and they prayed and thanked God for the opportunity to be punished about Acts chapter 3 or 4, then we watch as God sends a massive earthquake in, in recognition of what they're doing to turn over heaven and earth to spread the good news about Jesus Christ. So here, all of a sudden, this massive earthquake comes. And whenever it does, what it does is it breaks the stocks that they're caught into and it sets them free. And so instead of all of the criminals running out, including Paul and Silas, and what they do is they keep everybody there. They, they are successful in keeping all of the other prisoners there. But you see, the, the jailer, he's a Roman soldier. He may be an older Roman soldier. This is kind of his last attempt at serving in the Roman army. And then he gets to, quote unquote, retire. And so what's happened is the Roman law says, if any prisoner <coughs> escapes, you have to pay the price of the escaped prisoner. So the jailer thinks, well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to kill myself and spare my family the indignity 
of being kicked out if I'm only flogged. So right away, he comes with a sword in his hand. He's going to take his own life. He's going to pay the price because he thinks everybody's escaped. Well, what happens is, is Paul tells him, no, don't do that. He said, we're all here. So he gets down on his hands and knees, just like in this picture, and he, say, and he asks him, he says, what do I, here he is, there's Paul, there's Silas. He's saying, what do I have to do to be saved? And so Paul tells him right out, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So now we have not only freedom for Paul and Silas, we now have freedom from, this, from the obligation of having to kill himself. And so now we also have great joy because he gets to live and he gets to live a long life. And now what we have is even more joy. He's free for eternity. So the joy continues to come in significant ways. So now, after this, and this is all background, because Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke are now after this, they've been released, they go to the jailer's house, they have dinner, they get, they get uh, bathed and everything, and then they leave town. So after, we know that Paul has made a couple of other stops to Philippi. You can read about it in Acts 20 and some of the other places. But the main thing is, is that now we have a flourishing number of believers, and maybe even some of those prisoners that were there with Paul are now experiencing the joy of God's continual presence. And so that's what we want to talk about. And so the psalm says, David, who was harassed in the wilderness by the forces of Saul, says this in Psalm 16. It said, you make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16. So whenever we read that, we know that joy comes only from God and not from our own circumstances. And so whenever we start seeing that, we begin to understand what Paul is writing as he's chained in a Roman prison. So one of the things that he writes about is here in Philippians 3, 1 through 4, and he says this. He says, whatever happens, whatever happens, and that goes for us too, whatever happens, rejoice in the Lord. That's the most important thing. Not just rejoice, not just cheer, not just jump and shout, but rejoice in the ongoing, completing presence of God himself and rejoice in that. He also gives them a warning. And the warning is, look out for these bad guys. And so watch out for dogs. See, in Jewish culture, dogs are not pets. Sorry, Gizmo. Dogs are not pets. Dogs are, dogs are scavengers. They are on the outside of town. Whenever Jewish men would get up in the morning, if they were thoroughly going orthodox, they would say, Oh God, thank you that I'm not a dog or a woman, and I want your blessing today. So you know what they thought about the other gender, and you know what they thought about dogs, because the dogs were the ones that would scavenge, they would always be mangy, they would be on the outside. Nobody loved puppies. Okay, so they didn't have they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have YouTube, and so they didn't really like kitty cats either. So, uh, so anyway, he's saying, look out for these people. Now, why is he calling them that? Well, he's calling them that because since he left, there have been some people coming through saying that they know that you have to obey all of the Jewish laws including men have to be circumcised before you can truly be a follower of Christ. Did Jesus say that? No. Did Peter say that? No. Does Paul say that? No. Where does it say that? It doesn't. It's tradition. Somebody has bent the words of God's word and they have added to it. Oftentimes what you'll find is in religions, they will add words to what God has already said, or the opposite, they take away words from what God has already said. Um, 
Some people think that to live as a Christian, you need to go by this saying, we don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls that do. And so whenever you realize that that's not biblical, then you need to understand that following Jesus is easier from the standpoint of your performance than you thought. All it requires is that you believe in Him. Whenever you believe in Him, then you start changing on the inside. You start experiencing the joy that comes from knowing God. You start having the Holy Spirit within, and so you start understanding and knowing and being able to discern. You start being able to know where somebody is so that you can love on them, pray for them, and encourage them just as God wants you to do. So we find, though, that people that add or take away to God's Word about what we should do, and you find it in all kinds of churches. We find that sometimes, uh, I remember when you couldn't really come to church unless you had on a polyester three-piece suit. Uh, then it changed, you couldn't really be comfortable at church unless you had a leisure suit. Who knows what a leisure suit is? <laughs> Steve, you're the only one? Oh my goodness. You guys need to go back to the 70s. You know, being alive, being alive. Okay. So, we know that religious bondage or the need to adhere to man's rules don't bring joy. We even call, as pastors, we'll even call uh, uh, people who insist on all those extra biblical rules and so forth. Uh, and then they make discernment, uh, I mean, they, they make distinctions about people, they do judgmental things. We call them joy suckers because they will suck the joy out of your life in a heartbeat. Oh, you shouldn't be doing that. You know what I always do? See, that's a joy sucker, okay? So, what we need to understand is that whenever we are in religious bondage, it can be even worse than being in prison. <coughs> It still goes on in many forms, and it's contrary to what Jesus wants us to enjoy. So whenever we do that, we need to understand that religion, I am not a religious person. I do things religiously, but I am not a quote-unquote religious person because that it provides all of the answers in detail, and it's all about appearances. And so whenever we understand that the goal of God's Word is for us to have a relationship with God himself that was disturbed by Adam's and Eve's rebellion in the garden, but has been restored to us as we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then that's where we get the joy. So Paul, in contrast to this in our passage today, he lists his family resume. So here's what it is. Paul says this, and there's a whole bunch of details. He says, hey, I'm a thoroughgoing Jew, not like these guys. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day among the people of Israel. I wasn't brought in by proselytizing or by somebody else. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Remember the first king, Saul? He was of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. I am a Pharisee, and I strictly adhere to the law. And I'm so zealous that I even put people in prison for following Jesus. And so he's blameless. He says, I'm blameless. And so whenever he says that, he is telling these people in Philippi that all of that is worth nothing. And so whenever he does that, he is telling them that there is no joy in any of those things. And he's telling them that he is okay as far as he uh, is with Christ, then he experiences the joy that comes from knowing Christ. So what did he get besides all of his pain and suffering? What did his resume get us? Well, he says this. He says, whatever I gain I had, I counted all as loss for Christ. He gave up everything to follow Christ, to follow our Savior. And so whenever he did, he said, I want to be found in him. I want to know him. I want to be able to understand everything that he did. He's got great joy because he doesn't have to achieve the unachievable. God has already done it for us in our lives because of the Holy Spirit and His gift to us of the great grace that came in Christ. We're going to be celebrating the birth of Christ here in a month or so. 
it seems hard. I just remember the 4th of July. And uh, so here it comes already, the Christmas season. And so we are going to be celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that whenever Jesus came, and Paul reminds us of this, that Jesus had to borrow a birthplace? Yes. Do you know that he never owned a, 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 an ox cart? Yes. He never owned his own house? Yes. He had nowhere to live? Yes. He didn't own anything? That's right. What a Christ, what a God, what joy there was, though, in seeing him as he walked out his plans with the Father. He didn't own any real estate. He didn't have a bank account. He didn't have anything but a strong relationship with God the Father. Amen. So whenever we think about what it is that we get through faith, then we need to understand that the joy that we receive comes from accepting the right relationship with God because of His grace. What He did on the cross yes. didn't cost you anything. He did it as a free gift for you. Thank However, you. if you accept his free gift, then he will watch and empower you as you begin to change and become more and more like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Paul really suffered. If you, re if you remember the passage in Acts where he goes on the road to Damascus and Ananias comes and he goes <laughs> to pray for him and says, Father, I don't want to pray for this guy. He's put our fellow Christians in jail. God says to him in a vision, he says, you go because he's going as my agent to the Gentiles and he's going to suffer. And so Paul did. You can read in Acts chapter 11, you can read about how much Paul suffered. Day and a night afloat and adrift in the ocean, stoned and beaten and everything else. It's quite a list. And so whenever we read in 2 Corinthians 11 about all of those things that he went through, we marvel at the fact that he still has the joy that comes from knowing Christ. Yeah. So he experienced joy, he experienced happiness, but he experienced greater joy from knowing Christ. See, that's how it should be with us. It's kind of an ethereal thing. It's a mystery. How can we experience that joy? Right. But how about this? How about no more nightmares? Mm -hmm. All right. Do any of you have nightmares? Some of you have talked to me about nightmares. No more nightmares. You can tell the nightmares to be gone. Whenever you feel like you're in the middle of fear, in the middle of the night, and you're supposed to be getting your rest that God has ordained, and all of a sudden the enemy starts dropping thoughts into your dreams, you need to say, enemy, be gone. No more. You see, because what God wants you to do is have your rest so that you can minister the next day. God ordained for you to be rest. Even whenever he was doing creation, one day out of seven is a sign for you to rest. How do we do that in this, in this world, in this culture? Shut your smartphone off. Could you do it for a whole day? Could you do it? Some of you are old enough that you got by without a smartphone before smartphones. So you can do it easily. But we need to understand that God has great gifts for us, and one of them is sharing his joy with us and we get that you see one of the things that we need to do is quit pursuing happiness and instead pursue the relationship with god through jesus christ by the power of the holy spirit that brings us the joy that god has in watching us do it as we pursue god as we want a closer relationship with him not just get some eternal fire insurance but as we get to know God, then we will understand how much joy we actually can have. Even in the middle of adversity. Even in the middle of difficult circumstances. Even when you want to say, I am stressed out, here comes joy. Because you give it all to God. You still have to act wisely. You still have to act with understanding. But you now get a joy that comes from Him and Him alone. So we need to understand that there are some things that we need to do. So once you know him as Lord and Savior, once you know him as, as the giver of the joy that you've longed for all your life, then you need to know him more. If he's given you joy, 
why would you not want to know him on an even deeper level? I, I, get, a big, I get a big thrill out of singing songs. I won't do it publicly uh, because I'm in the joyful noise category. But I will, and when I'm at home, I get great joy out of singing songs as I'm working there on my computer or reading or whatever. The songs are going in my head and they're bringing me joy as I sing his praises and as I marvel at the creativity and the abilities of others. So what are we going to do? Okay, one of the things we're going to do too is as we know him, he has given us gifts. We are coming to the season when we're all excited about getting gifts. Well, he has given you the best gifts of all, not just a relationship with him, although that is absolutely incredible. Amen. But by his Holy Spirit, he has given you the ability through these gifts to be able to do all kinds of things, various kinds of helps, administrations, prayer, faith, all kinds of gifts he's given you. You can read about them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And along with the love that we have for others comes this great ability to be able to experience what God has for us. So have we opened those gifts? Have we, have we opened them up? Are we experiencing the joy that comes from them? And if the answer is no, then let me encourage you to do that. The final thing I want to ask is, are we really expressing Christ's love for others? Are we really, or are we just faking it? See, you can fake it, and you can fake it by just going through town, by just smiling at everybody, just greeting, just saying, hi, how are you? And then muttering like, what the heck does he think he's going doing coming to town dressed like that? Um, that's not love. What love is, is love means we encourage. If you sense that somebody wants money and you've got money, give it to them. God has more. We just need to express Christ's love to others in significant ways. So I've got two scriptures up here, and um, this is kind of in conclusion. You know what in conclusion means to a pastor? I've got 20 more minutes. Uh, so anyway, here's, here's two of them. You need to change your thinking. I say this a lot. Romans 12, verse 2. Be transformed. In other words, don't stay the same. Become thinking like God thinks. And you can actually do it. The Holy Spirit will help you do it. So be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Some of you have never read a book. How many have never read a book in the past six months? Haven't read a book in the past six months. Okay. What? Okay. So what you need to do is you need to read. You can read it on your smartphone. You can read it on your tablet. You can read it on your computer. You can read it wherever you want. But I like the, I like the feel of paper and the, and the texture of ink. So I like to read books. As a matter of fact, Emma told me I had to quit buying books. I didn't listen. So I'm still buying books. Okay. So then, if we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, then we can begin to think like God thinks. Whenever we come up against a difficult situation, we can think like He thinks, and then we can experience the joy of feeling His presence in every way. That's an important one. Now, some of you may say, well, I tried that and it just didn't work. And so look at the bottom scripture. Talk about some people like to run for the joy of running. I can't fathom that. I Sometimes I she tells me to get on a treadmill and I'm going like, I'd rather be rowing. You know what I discovered the other day? You know what I discovered the other day? I have calluses from rowing. I mean, I really do. I haven't had calluses for years. You tell. It's different from when I used to use tools all the time. So, but what we need to understand is that we need to pursue the relationship with God because every time we pursue Him, He is there ready with open arms for us. There's an old hymn that says, I sought the Lord and afterward I knew that I sought Him seeking me. In other words, while you were looking and while you were pursuing Him, He was actually going, come on, just a little bit further. Come on, trust me just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Come on, oh, there you are! And so we experience that great joy that comes from being with Him. 
So whenever we think about getting tired, getting weary, here's this great passage out of Isaiah. And so uh, it says here, they will soar on wings like eagles, they will run and not grow weary, they will walk and not be faint. So God, as you pursue him to discover even more of the joy that he has, you're going to find, like the Apostle Paul did, you're going to find the continuing strength to get through everything. How many of you are worried about Black Friday and the crowds at the store? <laughs> oh, good, I love you guys. Don't worry about Black Friday. Okay, why is it called Black Friday? You know why? Because that's when in the year a retailer typically goes into the black in his books. Instead of red, he makes it all up on the day after Thanksgiving. That's Black Friday. That's your tidbit for the day. That's probably the only thing you'll remember. But, but anyway, remember this one too, Philippians 3. Okay, and uh, so what we need to do is we need to pursue him he gives us strength. He gives us the ability to rest. He gives us his gifts. He shares with us the attributes that he can. And we get to walk with him. We get to bring people joy and freedom in a way that they've never experienced before. To me, that's what it's all about. Bringing freedom from bondage, from what other people say, or how other people want you to act, Bringing the freedom that comes with Christ. Now you may be sitting there saying, I tried it and it didn't work. See, people say that about following Christ. But G.K. Chesterton said, it's not that Christianity doesn't work. It's that it hasn't been tried. And therefore, it hasn't worked. So we need to pursue him in our thoughts, in our, in our, in our songs, in everything that we do. In our manner of speech, we need to do that. We need to do it in every way, and we will find the joy that is beyond human understanding. Amen? Amen. Stand with me and we'll pray.